Good evening and welcome to Bible study. Continuing our journey through the book of Mark, we've just concluded the crucifixion and how important that was for you and I and when we truly understand the sacrifice, the gift that God gave to us, the price that was paid for our sin, the the pain that Jesus had to endure, the mocking, the shaming, the scourging, the scorning, just brutal, and he did it for the love for us. And salvation would be made possible because of the, the, the pure, the perfect, the innocent one, Jesus, that he became sin for us. He who knew no sin became sin so that we can become the righteousness of God. And And once Jesus kind of breathed his last breath on the cross, and when he said, it is finished, it's as if this time clock would begin because sundown was coming and his body would need to be placed into a tomb. And we're going to look at eight verses tonight. We're going to look at verses 40 to 47 of Mark chapter 15. And and we'll see this kind of need to, to expedite what's going on, the There'll be a problem. We'll see the solution to the problem. There'll be some unexpected news that they'll get, and there will be a proper burial. So we're going to do that. So I pray you got your Bibles, your notepads, your pens, your beverage of choice, whatever it may be. I am drinking some espresso. Uh, And we are going to read verses 40 to 47, and that's to the end of the chapter. And it goes like this. There were also women watching from a distance. Among them were Miriam from Magdala, Miriam, the mother of Jacob, the younger of the Joses, and Salome. They would follow him and serve him when he was in Galilee. Many other women who had gone up together with him to Jerusalem were there also. Now evening had already come since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before Shabbat. Joseph of Arimathea, a respected council member who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Yeshua's body. Pilate was surprised that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him whether Yeshua had been dead for long. When Pilate learned this from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Joseph bought a linen cloth, took him down, wrapped him in the linen, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Miriam from Magdala and Miriam, the mother of Joseph, was watching where Yeshua's body was placed. So, as uh, we, we know now, Jesus has, has died, but has not been officially pronounced dead yet. This has to be verified by Pilate. He would be the one that would have to verify it. His body hanging as a spectacle for everybody to see on the cross. And I can imagine that maybe the disciples, they they were at a distance viewing the very event which Jesus told them that he was going to have to undergo. And it's interesting that Mark mentions that there was a group of followers who were looking upon Jesus at a distance, but not the individuals that we probably would have expected, right? Verse 40 tells us that in the company of onlookers were women, and among them was Mary uh, Magdalene from Magdala. Super cool place. If you come with us in 2025, you'll actually get to go to Magdala and see this village. It's a village that... uh, is west of the Sea of Galilee, right on the shores. There was Mary, mother of James, the less James the younger, and and Joseph and Salome, uh, who was the mother of the sons of Zebedee. It really was these faithful women who encountered Jesus' ministry early, and they served him while he was in Galilee. Now these women find themselves looking upon a dead Jesus, the one whom they've loved, the one whom they cared for. I, I can almost think that it's this feeling of utter helplessness that, man, we can't do a thing. 
And I find it interesting because at no point during Jesus' death in Mark's gospel does he mention really the sighting of the 11 disciples. He doesn't say really anything about them. The only sighting of the disciples on the scene is John himself, the beloved disciple. So here we find the women faithfully at a distance and at a distance for a reason. There's a reason they are at a distance. Uh, And upon Jesus' death, time was of the essence because with evening already have come meant that at 6 p.m. a new day was going to begin. That's when the new day began, according to the Jewish reckoning. And at the start of this new day meant that the first day of the feast of unleavened bread would begin. And according to Jewish custom, the first and last days of the feast of unleavened bread were always considered the high Sabbaths. And you can, Exodus chapter 12 talks about that. Leviticus 23 talks about that. And being that Passover fell on a Thursday in this year meant that the high Sabbath would be followed by a typical weekly Sabbath. So this year meant that there would be two Sabbaths back to back. And being that this was the case, there was an even more of a reason to, to hurry, to expedite with the removal of Jesus' body, now dead, to get it off the cross and get it into a tomb. So being that there was this double Sabbath, this year meant that all the work would cease until Sunday, and this included really the preparation for burial. And according to Jewish law, it required proper burial for all bodies, including those who were executed as criminals. And for a proper burial to occur before Sabbath meant that the body would, number one, need to be requested by a victim's relative. Number two, it would have to be properly wrapped and prepared for burial according to the custom. And number three, it would have to be buried either in a family graveyard or in a tomb. And all of this was expected to be accomplished before 6 p.m., before the start of a new day. According to our scene, no relatives were there. No men were currently present to really help remove Jesus' body off the cross. And there was no tomb that had been made available. So this potentially could have worried the women, which is why they were looking on from a distance. For they certainly couldn't remove Jesus' body from the cross themselves. They had no grave to put him in as tombs were typically located where you live, and they were actually very expensive. So I, I imagine that these women were looking there with, and maybe they were praying that someone would take him down and properly prepare him before, for burial before 6 p.m. Because at worst, those who were unclaimed, they would have been tossed into Valley of of the Valley of Hinnom, which was near the Kidron Valley. And it would seem that if, despite these barriers, that God always has a plan, right? He's sovereign, that, that God had provided the means for a proper burial of Jesus. He's never early and he's never late. And maybe you've experienced that in your own life. And the solution was provided by a rather prominent, yet it was a very familiar character, who had everything in place. And and we see that in verse 43. Let me just go back and read it here. Oh, uh, it's on this side, verse 43. Joseph of Arimathea, a respected council member, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked him for Yeshua's body. So Mark mentions this character, Joseph of Arimathea who was a prominent member of the Sanhedrin council, that he would be the one used to expedite the process of Jesus' burial. This would have been an unusual sight to see a request to make by a man of such kind of social and economic clout. He wasn't just a nobody. For someone of such clout, 
to aid in the care of burial of Jesus, knowing what he was crucified for, kind of would have caused a whole lot of social alienation, most likely. This would have <coughs> been equivalent of kind of wearing uh, a I love beef at a PETA conference, right? I love beef. Um, so w- one seen as a Jesus kind of call it a sympathizer would easily lead to one's social alienation. Maybe even death could have been possible. So Joseph's actions at this point seem to be a bit emboldened given his religious position. Mark tells us that he was actually waiting for the kingdom of God. It says that right in there, that waiting for the kingdom of God. And this becomes an interesting statement for you and I, the reader, to note because it goes beyond the fact that Joseph was waiting fulfillment of the kingdom. This was the anticipation for the most uh, in, in that day. However, the, the distinction as to how that kingdom would come about, that becomes the key. So clearly, Joseph of Arimathea believed that Jesus, that he was the promised one by which this fulfillment of the kingdom would come. And this becomes confirmed when we take a glance at John's gospel, when we get out of Mark's and we go to John's gospel in John 19, verse 38, that says this, And after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for the fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission. So he came and he took his body. So where there was a bit of, call it trepidation, regarding the request for Jesus' body, Mark emphasizes the actions of Joseph beyond the fear that he could potentially face. Because the text mentions in verse 33, the latter part of it, that he gathered up courage. That, and that phrase, gathered up, in Greek is uh, tolmeo, which means to show boldness or resolution in the face of danger. If you were to read it, read it in the Christian Standard Bible, the translation states it this way, and boldly went to Pilate to ask for Jesus' body. Really, in other words, nothing and nobody was going to stand in the way of Joseph, of jo- of Joseph getting to Jesus because his mind was set on it. He was like, no, I'm doing this. And where Joseph maybe once stood silent and secretly as a disciple of Jesus, his commitment would be made publicly known now as he asks for the body. And I think what a beautiful example of being bold for Jesus, despite the culture around you. And I think maybe it, it, the question arises and comes about, is our relationship is our discipleship with Jesus is it secretive or are we living a bold life not worrying about what others are going to say not worrying about what others are going to do not worrying about if our relationship if our faith is going to lead to alienation but we are just concerned about pleasing and loving and serving Jesus think about it if the Lord were to lead you to evangelize to share your faith Uh, to serve others, would you be moved boldly or would you remain quiet and timid? Right, Because that's what we're called to do, to preach and proclaim the good news to everyone everywhere. We're called to do that. And I believe the text right here shows us that that, that from when Joseph and Jesus first met in the evening, it was secret, to now public, there has been some great growth in the heart of Joseph. He moves really from being this secret disciple to now being a visible follower, a visible disciple of Jesus. And as Jesus mentioned in Mark chapter 8, we have to go back to Mark chapter 8, verses 34 and 35, discipleship, it comes with what? A great cost. It's not easy. It's going to cost you everything to follow and to serve Jesus. That to follow Jesus, we know, is a denying of the self. 
and actually being invited to come and to die with Jesus, that, that we're to pick up our cross daily and follow him. And what do I mean death? We're going to die a physical death? No, there's a death to our comforts. There's a death to our convenience. There's a death to our cares. That is exchange to pursue all that Jesus calls and commands us to. I'll tell you, man, discipleship is not for the, the weak or the faint of heart. And at the heart of it, discipleship is a choice that you make. Nobody forces you into it, right? It's a choice that you make. You're either in or you're out. But you can't have, it's almost like, hey, I want my cake. and uh, You can't have your cake and, and eat it too, right? There, it's either you're in or you're out. There's no half-hearted when it comes to being a disciple, when it comes to following, when it comes to serving Jesus, and I think this is what Mark helps you and I, the reader, to see about Joseph's, Joseph's actions. Uh, and because of his bold actions, Joseph is forever etched within the gospel of count, the, the gospel accounts. His story is told. And so maybe a quick question for you and I to ponder or to consider privately. Uh, how will your participation really in the gospel work to impact those you will never see, right? How is that going to work in your home, <clears throat> in your marriage, on the job, maybe at school, at your, uh, when you're out and about with your, with your neighbors? How will others be impacted by your boldness for Jesus? Great question, right? Great question. And I think it's from this demonstration of great boldness and allegiance to Jesus that in this investigation arose by the request of Pilate. And what's it say in verse 44 and 45? Let's, let's, let's read it. Uh, Pilate was surprised that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked for, uh, had been dead for long. When Pilate learned this from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. So, Pilate receiving the request for the body of Joseph, sorry, not the body of Joseph, for the body of Jesus by Joseph seemed to come at a bit of a surprise. And, and Mark says, well, Pilate wondered, like, hey, if he was dead by this time, it had it, it only really been a few hours. And that Greek word for wondered is the word uh, thaumazo. I think that's how you pronounce it. It means to marvel or to be amazed. And the reason for Pilate's amazement, because death by, crucifix by crucifixion wasn't a quick process. It was painful. And individuals who were crucified could last up to four days. And really to expedite the process, what they would do is they would break the legs of the people so they can no longer kind of press up and, and grasp uh, for those precious breasts. So, so the announcement of the death so soon moved Pilate to inquire, saying, is this really true? Could he really be dead already? And as a result, what does he do? He summons a centurion. More than likely, it was somebody who witnessed Jesus's last breath to provide, hey, give me a report. Let me know what went down. Is he really dead? And if the centurion summoned to Pilate was indeed the one who witnessed Jesus' last breath, then the record shows that Jesus' seemingly early death, along with some unique events surrounding it, it was quite unique. So it would be after receiving this report confirming Jesus' death that without requiring a fee, what happens? Pilate releases Jesus' body to Joseph. And this release without a fee could also address maybe Pilate's wonderment about who Jesus was. And then all of a sudden, Mark transitions you and I, the reader, immediately to the next scene where preparation for a proper burial commences to actually meet with the Jewish requirements of a proper burial before a high Sabbath. So let's read it. <clears throat> Verse 46 and 47. Joseph bought a linen cloth, took him down, wrapped him in the linen, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. 
Then he rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Miriam from Magdala and Miriam, the mother of Joseph, was there watching where Yeshua's body was placed. So although Mark chooses really to omit this detail, um, John indicates that in his gospel that Nicodemus, who was a fellow Sanhedrin member, really accompanied Joseph with the burial preparation. And it would be seem as if this maturity and boldness to come upon Nicodemus as well, because he too, he was a secret disciple at first. And when he in first inquired of Jesus at night. And now both men, they've made public declarations to who their Messiah was and to where their allegiance was. It was with Jesus. And time is continuing to count down to as 6 p.m. is approaching quickly. And I can imagine Joseph running out, maybe out of breath as he arrives at Golgotha, the place of the skull. Maybe he summons some of the guards to take down Jesus, um, to remove the nails and the crown of thorns alongside him, Nicodemus, who, according to John's gospel, ha has brought the, the proper burial materials to prepare Jesus' body. Uh, they would begin by washing his body, which was then followed by the proper application of spices, of the linens. Uh, and this is what John records in verses 39 to 40 uh, in John 19. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh, if you remember our series, The Gift, it was used for embalming and getting bodies ready. And aloes, about 100 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen, wrapping it with the spices as in the burial custom of the Jews. So from this point, they hurried to the tomb, which belonged to Joseph of Arimathea, which was kind of cut out of the rock. And once they laid Jesus' body in the tomb, they rolled a large stone in front of it. The stone probably weighed about a half a ton. And therefore, it required at least two men to move it into place. And on top of that, the stone was rolled down a slight incline, which made it a little bit easier at the end of the ramp. And the door would almost kind of lock into place, causing it to be unopened from uh, the inside. And, and I think just briefly, I, I want to mention what Matthew states in his gospel here, because he states that the tomb in which Jesus uh, laid was Joseph's new tomb. And this detail speaks to the sacrifice alone that Joseph made, being that he lived in Arimathea. Perhaps he had a tomb there. Whatever the case uh, may be, in serving the Lord Jesus in his death, Joseph prepares and presents his, his very best for the master. And this becomes a core aspect of service when when, when we are following Jesus in Christendom, right? That our service to Christ and to others, although at time costly, is to be to the glory of God and to the good of the body. And ultimately, when we see this, it is through Joseph's extravagant giving that we see his actions are actually fulfilled. Um, his actions are fulfilled scripture. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 9, his grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. And finally, Mark kind of rounds out chapter 15 with the same women who have both viewed the death of Jesus and now the burial of Jesus. And, and all these women, although these women were unable to physically assist in the preparation of Jesus' body, they would soon be able to, uh, to service him as witnesses to his disciples. But before any of that would happen, their ability to witness would first begin with great fear and astonishment because their return to this same tomb would be met with complete shock come a couple days later. So with chapter 15 kind of coming to a close, let's kind of take the, our remaining time together to, ad to address what may be the, the big elephant in the room, and that is what day of the week did Jesus die? Right, what day of the week? For some, the reading of the previous verses would seem to indicate that Jesus died on a Friday, given it was day, the day before the Sabbath. However, there are three things worth considering, which we mentioned earlier in the text. That is, John's account mentions that this was the day, the day of preparation. 
Secondly, in the same account, the, the rationale for the rush to the grave was due to the high Sabbath for Passover. And the explanation of high Sabbath during festival weeks was not anything new, but rather reflected in the Hebrew Bible with verses such as Exodus chapter 12 and Leviticus chapter 23. And number three, lastly, Jesus provided us with a math verse, if you will, how many days he would remain dead and in the time which he would rise. And we find that this verse in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, which is known as the sign of Jonah. So let's read Matthew 12, verse 40. And it says, for, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus mentions that he would be in the grave for three days and three nights. And as we have studied the Jewish reckoning of days, it refers to the periods of dark and light. <clears throat> By knowing the day on which Jesus rose from the grave, according to Scripture, we can work backwards to identify the day of the week in which he died. And as you may be aware, there have been many days debated and discussed regarding the day in which Jesus died. There's a lot of theological writings have been done arguing everything from Wednesday death to a Friday death. However, right, the best way to resolve it is, hey, let's read the scriptures. Do the scriptures tell us, right? We don't have to go anywhere else to find it if we find it in the scriptures. So to figure out the biblical day of Jesus' death, let's look at the traditional date of his death, which is said to be Friday. That's why they call it Good Friday. And in counting, remember, we don't include Sunday's light portion because the gospel records tell us that very early on the first day of the week, right? Mark tells us that. Now, Luke's gospel states that as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week. So according to the Greek-English lexicon, dawn is the period that precedes daybreak while it is still dark. So Matthew's gospel tells us in Matthew 28, verse 1, as it began to dawn, which means we have not yet arrived at the light portion of Sunday. So with that in mind, uh, we, we, we begin with a Friday date given our, our kind of math verses in, in, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. If we place Friday as the day of Passover all the while not emphasizing the high Sabbath that has been mentioned in John's gospel, and keep the weekly Sabbath as it is, we kind of get this result. So a Friday date of crucifixion still leaves us with the remaining light portion and dark portion unaccounted for. So <laughs> let's look at a Thursday date as a possibility. If we place Thursday as the day of preparation, which is Passover, and place Friday as the high Sabbath, followed by the weekly Sabbath, then that puts the third day as, uh-oh, Sunday. And even more so, if we look at chapter 16, the first two verses, we see that Mark mentions that the Sabbath being over, which is followed by the phrase, very early on the first day of the week, that is said in verse 2 of chapter 16. So I believe this further affirms a Thursday date as um, the exclusion of a day portion counting. Because as we'll, we'll, we'll see next week when we get into Mark chapter 16, Mark seems to suggest that Mary Magdalene married the mother of Jesus and Salome left their homes during the early hours to arrive at the tomb. And it would be upon the arrival, the sun was beginning to rise. But in an effort not to get ahead, I, I think we need to, to highlight a few things. Number one, holding to a high view of Scripture, kind of that's the best benefit. It's a huge benefit to understanding the Scriptures and allow us to grow more in our faith. Secondly, trying to pinpoint the exact day and time in which Jesus died, although very beneficial, really it does not kind of impact one's salvation, right? It doesn't change anything. It is his finished work alone that saved us, not on knowing the day that he died. And, and we got to rest in that truth. And lastly, 
as we kind of pursue truth to, to be grace-filled and to seek not, not trying to prove to be right, but rather to allow the Holy Spirit to bring about the necessary illumination needed in our hearts and lives. And, and the reality is, you too, you need grace, right? You needed the grace and the time to get where you are today. And as we prepare to kind of dive into the final chapter of Mark, we are going to kind of encounter probably one of the most debated textual criticisms within kind of evangelicalism uh, today, and that is the last verses, the last 12 verses of Mark chapter 16. We'll get into that. And the question that comes to mind for many is, how does one deal with what is known as the longer ending of Mark? And, but that is for, for next week and, and our final weeks as we tackle the, really the last 20 verses and come to really what I will say is a proper biblical conclusion to the author's intent. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how amazing it is, for how life-giving it is, for how life-changing it is. We just love, we just love it. And, and Father, I pray um, it continues to come alive in our hearts in our spirits, as we read it, as we study it, that we're going to grow closer to you, have a better understanding. Not so we can have arrogance and this piety, thinking that we're better, but just so we can have a better understanding of knowing you, because your word reveals who you are, and we want to get to know you. So, Father, I pray you continue to speak to us. I pray you continue to challenge us. And even as we're coming to a conclusion in the chapter 16 of Mark, um, I, I pray daily as we read it, your word comes alive like never before. We love you. We give you praise, honor, and glory in your wonderful name. And everybody said, amen. Well, bless you guys. Uh, uh, have yourself a great rest of the evening. Hopefully, we'll see you tomorrow at, uh, at church. Uh, we are continuing our series on The Time Is Now, and looking at how do we begin to break some bad habits in our life? Yet last week we looked at how we start habits. This is how do we break some habits that need to be broken. So it's going to be a great uh, evening. We'd love to have you. Uh, pray you're kind of continuing with your fast. And then marked on your calendars, February 4th, where we will conclude our fast with a night of prayer and worship. We'd love to have you join us for that. So make sure it's in your calendar. Uh, other than that, bless you guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye for now.